right, so in this video, we are going to talk about how businesses can take advantage of outsourcing. Outsourcing is when a business hires another organization to perform some kind of service, uh, usually because the business that's actually doing the outsourcing doesn't want to invest the time in creating that service or hiring experts or you know, they don't want to have extra management time being spent on managing that service or anything like that. Uh, that service could be completely outside of the scope of the business in question. So that business might decide to outsource it. They hire on another company whose specialty is that uh, outsourced service. You know, they already have the expertise. They already know how to perform that service extremely well. So they don't have any startup costs that they have to worry about or anything like that. Uh, they have their own management, so they're working independently. And it saves the business that is doing the outsourcing just a lot of time and money. Outsourcing is actually extremely common in a lot of businesses. And you'll probably have seen quite a few of these examples that I'm about to talk about because these examples may or may not show up at Alan Hancock. Um, as well as possibly other places that you have experience in. For example, food vendors, a lot of companies will hire catering companies or restaurants or food trucks or all that kind of stuff in order to provide food for a specific organization. Um, we have the cafeteria at Allen Hancock. There's also times when Allen Hancock will uh, hire food trucks in order to service a particular event or something like that. Uh, portable bathroom suppliers, you'll see these in a lot of different places where work is being done, where bathrooms are needed, but it's not a good idea to permanently install them. Uh, for example, a construction project might make use of portable bathrooms because the plumbing for that building hasn't been installed yet and there might not be accessible bathrooms in other places. So that's where you need those porta potty type of uh, contraptions, I'll call them, uh, in order to make sure that workers are able to use the bathroom when they need to. College bookshops is a great example. Um, I actually talked about this earlier on in the class, but uh, the Alan Hancock uh, bookshop is run by the company Ifole, which uh, provides textbooks to students. So they take control of actually managing and supplying and providing materials. Uh, and Alan Hancock doesn't need to worry about that. They don't need to have a separate division within the college where they're um, trying to negotiate prices with suppliers and make sure that all the school supplies and textbooks and stuff are accessible and ready for students, all that kind of stuff. No, none of that needs to be handled by Alan Hancock. They don't need to build up a team in order to handle that. They don't need to train anyone to handle that kind of stuff. They can just outsource it to the company, which is already um, proficient in doing all of those tasks, already has great relationships with suppliers, and in fact, can probably get even better deals than Alan Hancock individually could on some things like school supplies because they're able to order them in a massive amount of bulk for all of the schools that they service, and then distribute everything as needed to each school. So that would be a reason why Alan Hancock is uh, outsourcing that to these companies. And then email servers are also very common. Um, it's very common to see a company or organization use an email server from a provider like uh, Microsoft, you know, Microsoft Outlook is an email server that we use to control our Hancock.edu and my Hancock.edu email addresses. So they're handling the email, uh, the actual storage of emails, but also providing custom domains for us that we can use to send emails. They're building up a custom server for Alan Hancock using cloud technology and giving all the benefits of cloud technology in terms of scalability and resilience and whatnot, uh, giving all of those benefits to our email server. 
Compare that to if Alan Hancock had to build its own email server and uh, had to maintain the server hardware and hire on additional people in order to do that, hire on and train them, make sure that they actually were proficient in setting up and maintaining an email server, uh, all kinds of security risks as well. So like making sure that there's a good security plan for all the emails and all that kind of stuff. And the costs just keep on adding up as well as the complexity. So it makes a lot of sense to outsource emails. Now, I kind of touched on this a little, a little bit with the last example, but a lot of companies will actually consider outsourcing parts of their information system, especially if things need to be custom built for an information system or if there are uh, technologies that are needed, but there's a lack of experience within the company. So any of these might be reasons why companies might want to outsource their information systems and doing so gives uh, three major advantages, which I'll talk about one at a time. The first is a set of management advantages, which come in a few different flavors. Uh, the first is that you can really quickly obtain expertise in certain areas that you might not be able to if you actually had to hire people with expertise. So, you know, you have a new technology that you're trying to integrate. You can, instead of trying to do a whole bunch of hiring, assemble a team of uh, technical people who have all of these kinds of skills, get them working together, get them trained in existing procedures, do all the screening, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's a lot of time that could be spent actually working on a product. So what you can do is you can try to outsource. You can get in contact with a company that employs engineers who already have this kind of experience. They already have it, they're ready to go. They can do contract work, build up a system, uh, deliver it to your business, and then you just have this piece of the puzzle that totally works. And it doesn't just have to be companies as well. You can outsource to individuals who happen to have skills that you are missing. This is really important, especially because technical skills tend to change very rapidly. Uh, the different programming languages or the different uh, services that are used or provided and used by different companies, all that kind of stuff can change very quickly as technology advances, as certain companies might go out of business, all that kind of stuff. So all of these changes mean that if you're maintaining your own workforce entirely, you would have to either train workers or hire new workers who have skills that go along with this kind of change, or you might have to just accept the fact that you're not going to take advantage of this particular technology or service, and you just have to use something that's a little more outdated in order to keep your engineers, if you happen to like them quite a bit. So if you don't want to deal with all that, you can hire on some uh, external workers. Uh, you can outsource to those workers. You can have them do the work that you need in order to take advantage of these new te technological shifts, integrate that into your information system, and then when more technological shifts happen and you realize, oh, here's a new thing that I need to integrate in, you can outsource to a new group of um, people, whether that's a new company or a new set of engineers. You can also avoid management problems this way. Um, and the management problems might come in a couple forms. One is that if you're hiring on too many new engineers, you might uh, overload some of the existing management that you already have. And when managers are not able to fully keep track of everything that's going on, it could be easy for things to sort of slip between the cracks and uh, you know, bad things to start happening in the information system. This could be especially pertinent when it comes to management roles with uh, security obligations, like the uh, CISO position we talked about before. If that CISO is overwhelmed because uh, there's a lot of engineers working on a lot of stuff all at once, uh, that could lead to potential security vulnerabilities, which, you know, bad things happen. We talked a lot about that in chapter 10. However, with outsourcing, it's very possible that, especially if you outsource to a company rather than just a set of individual contractors, they have their own management and that management is already trained in 
the expertise that you are trying to hire them for. So rather than your management also having to learn things about these new technologies that you're trying to take advantage of, uh, you have management at this external company that already know what they're doing, already know how to work with their engineers, and it becomes a whole lot easier for them to have good leadership and make a quality product. Another possible benefit of outsourcing your information systems work, you know, and I want to clarify, I don't remember if I did or not, but this isn't outsourcing the entirety of the information system necessarily. It could be outsourcing a small piece of it, or it could be outsourcing a pretty large chunk of it, but then you would still have to write procedures and integrate it possibly with your hardware and software and stuff like that. But just wanted to give that note. Anyway, another possible benefit of outsourcing information systems is um, actually reducing the amount of cost for you to uh, create that portion of the information system that you're trying to outsource. So for example, you know, the, the I guess there's a couple of ways in which this could occur. For one, you're not paying money uh, training people, whether that's engineers or management. You're not wasting money uh, training people on getting up to speed with this new thing. You're not uh, opening up to possible security vulnerabilities with adopting a new technology without full knowledge of that new technology. You don't have to worry about any of that. You're just paying someone who already knows all of that. That startup cost is essentially offloaded to someone else. So you don't need to worry about it. There's another way though, and it kind of works. It, it, it's a little bit sort of similar to what we talked about with cloud hosting where uh, since cloud providers are able to provide services for a whole bunch of people all at once and they're able to um, they have this sort of standardized interface by which a customer of a cloud service has to interact with that interface in a very particular way, modify their procedures around it, that cloud vendor is able to, at a very low cost, host all of that, um, host all of these companies all at once on their servers. So it's like one big server controlled by one company versus if all of those companies were building their own servers, they all would be putting in a ton of cost into that kind of thing versus the cloud company is putting in a lot less cost because they, um, not only are they getting economy of scale, you know, they're buying a whole bunch of computer hardware in bulk so they get a better price, but they only have to do that setup work once to cover all 25 companies. So the, um, the sort of startup cost in that sense is a lot lower than if you look at the collective startup cost for all 25 companies there. So the cloud server the cloud service provider can also offload their startup cost onto the, uh, say, I think it's the 25, the uh, 25 companies that are their customers that they are hosting stuff for. And it generally, generally saves everyone money. And you can have similar things with any other type of outsourcing of um, information systems work. So for example, the textbook gives the, uh, talks about payroll applications. If 25 different organizations are developing their own payroll applications, um, you know, they have that huge startup cost in terms of actually making that payroll cost collectively between all 25, that's going to be a lot of money. And then updating it as tax law changes uh, will be another big cost collectively between all 25 it's going to be massive and that's going to keep on happening over and over and over again because tax law keeps on changing whereas one company uh managing or creating a payroll application that then a lot of other companies can use and in a sense outsourcing from that company there's one sort of cost there's one cost for updating everything they can spread that cost out across all the companies that they are charging for their services and the companies themselves are paying quite a bit less in order to use this service and the uh the payroll company 
is paying quite a bit less in the end when you account for the fact that they're able to recoup their startup costs and their update costs by charging people to use their payroll software. So it can work really well for everyone. There's also the idea of risk reduction. You can reduce risk by outsourcing your information systems development work. Uh, there's a few different types of risk that we're going to talk about here. The first one is a financial risk. Um, when you develop something in-house, you don't necessarily know if it's going to work ahead of time. You can try to make your best guesses. You can try to make best guesses as for how long it will take to develop a system like that. As business leaders have discovered over the years of working with computer technology, especially working with programmers, you can't necessarily 100% say it will be done in this amount of time. I can finish it in this amount of time because something always goes wrong when you're writing programs, uh, when you're dealing with technology, when you're making any computer system, something will always go wrong and the process of debugging it, the process of looking through and making sure, um, you know, everything is going well, fixing the things that need to be fixed takes a very long time, especially because you can fix one thing and introduce errors in other things as a result. It's not like making corrections in an essay or something like that. Uh, it One change in a code can sort of domino effect into all kinds of other things. And fixing code can take a long time. So taking a variable amount of time also means a variable amount of money. And there's a huge amount of risk involved in this because you're trying to allocate money for something that you don't know how long it will take to make it work in order to start generating profit off of it. You also don't know how long, uh, or I guess how good it will be, and you don't know um, if it will even work. So you're essentially putting a huge financial risk in terms of paying for the development of this kind of software. However, when you outsource, um, you might either already have that work done, um, which means that you have a fixed price that you know what you will be paying, or if it's uh, something that needs to be custom developed, but it's being done by experts in the field, uh, you might be able to trust that the financial risk you're putting in has a greater chance of reward, especially if they are on the hook uh, contractually for providing you some kind of service. They might really, uh, really, really, really try to make sure that it is good. So you can reduce financial risk through outsourcing information systems stuff. Now, I uh, briefly mentioned this, but you can also ensure a certain level of quality uh, through outsourcing. Um, especially if you are outsourcing to experts rather than trying to train your own uh, people into becoming proficient with a new technology or hiring people who are proficient with a new technology. Um, theoretically, if you are outsourcing to a company or outsourcing to uh, experts who have a huge amount of experience, theoretically, you can be a, you know feel a little safer in the idea that they are more likely to get it done and they're more likely to do it well and right um it is very easy to make a bad uh information system especially when you're first getting started with a new technology it's very easy to make mistakes that you aren't necessarily aware of or know that you should be looking out for until things bad things are already happening because learning new technologies can be a lot of work so outsourcing out to people who already know this stuff can be really beneficial in terms of ensuring quality or avoiding the risk of bad quality and then finally there's implementation risk uh, you can have all the components of a good information system each individual component could work really, really well, but they could be incompatible with each other. So when you actually take your components and try to implement them into an information system and they happen to not work at all because of maybe a fundamental misunderstanding of some of the technology or uh, services that you're trying to take advantage of, you know, 
there's always that risk that something goes wrong in implementation uh, when you're trying to work with new technology or you're trying to build a new information system. So uh, hiring on an expert, uh, outsourcing to a company that deals with this kind of stuff or outsourcing to individual experts can help mitigate that risk because they would have a better idea of how compatible everything might be and maybe even how to best fit things into your information system based on the priorities that you have developed. You can communicate with these experts and say, these are the things that we need that are non-negotiable. Here are some things that are nice, but they are negotiable if there are better ways, if they would conflict with better ways of whatever you're trying to create. Uh, you can do that kind of work and the expert will have a good idea of how to implement uh, everything into the system that you are building or how to actually do that implementation themselves if they are trying to create the entire information system. Now it's becoming more and more common for companies to outsource to other countries where labor happens to be really cheap. Uh, this might mean uh, making contracts with individuals in those countries who are offering their skills for much less money than uh, someone in, say, the United States of America might be trying to ask for. This could also be making contracts with uh, companies in other countries that have a whole bunch of workers for, you know, particular tasks. Uh, these countries are typically going to be ones with pretty bad economies, um, ones where it's been really hard for them to try to bring their economy back up, sometimes for internal or external reasons. Uh, these countries might have low worker protections, meaning that there's a either a very, very, very low minimum wage or no guaranteed minimum wage. And these might be countries where uh, workers try to rely on the gig economy in order to, say, do this type of outsourcing work. Uh, they will try to post on websites that are accessible all across the world and try to get people from uh, countries like the United States to hire them in exchange for their services. Um, now, this is becoming increasingly common in uh, companies based in the United States and in Europe to outsource out internationally. You see this a lot in customer service in order to either help maintain a 24-7 service for customers who might need service uh, in the middle of the night or at any point in the day. Uh, you can see this in programming. Um, there's more and more companies that are outsourcing programming jobs to other countries because software engineers in other countries might uh, not be given as much pay. So those countries can take advantage of the fact that uh, those workers are not, are not being paid as much. Uh, there's also user-generated content moderation. Uh, social media is not able to fully rely on artificial intelligence to moderate content. Uh, typically the best you can get is a type of filtering artificial intelligence that tries to understand, um, you know, foul language, negative sentiment, inappropriate pictures, all that kind of stuff and filter them out. But a majority of the workload is being done by people who sit in front of computers and rapid fire go through um, post after post after post after post, uh, accepting, rejecting, accepting, rejecting, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of that kind of work is being outsourced internationally. We talked about non-routine cognitive skills in chapter one, where the authors uh, talked about this list of skills that are really important for keeping your job in the modern market. And outsourcing tends to be why. Um, 
you know, customer service skills by themselves are easy to train. Uh, content moderation skills by themselves are easy to train. Even writing up documents by themselves, uh, plenty of people can write up documents if they are told what to write up. Uh, or editing things, or typing uh, reports, based, or typing uh, audio reports, or subtitling, or those kinds of jobs are easy to train, and you see that stuff being outsourced more and more, whether it's through companies or through like gig economy contracts with other workers. Uh, programming is a pretty notable one, because for a long time, programming was considered a skill that wasn't really outsourceable. Um, but it turns out that programming itself, lear learning a programming language and being able to program decently enough is not super hard of a skill. So job complexity in terms of what's being outsourced is increasing. Uh, people are outsourcing uh, more and more complex jobs because they're able to save money. And the skills that will keep someone in the United States from losing their job due to the company they work for outsourcing, deciding to outsource it to someone else, um, those non-routine skills that we talked about in chapter one are going to be really helpful in helping someone keep their job. It's the difference between, say, uh, someone who can write up a document about how a particular technology works based on uh, feedback that they are given from people who work on that technology and someone who is able to look at that technology, understand what's going on, and write things up on their own directive. It's uh, all about communication and management skills and all that kind of stuff. So that's uh, an important note when it comes to this discussion of outsourcing is that companies will try to cut costs in any way that they can. And if they see workers who are um, doing work that could be easily outsourced elsewhere, uh, they will take that opportunity. So the idea is to uh, build up your skills in order to prevent that kind of thing from happening, especially building up these non-routine cognitive skills that can't really be found just anywhere. So right here, these are some different ways that different pieces of the information system uh, can actually be outsourced. So uh, on the hardware side of things, an example of a way that the hardware part of an information system can be outsourced is the infrastructure as a service cloud hosting, where instead of building up your own hardware, you're essentially outsourcing that to a cloud provider and then doing everything that you would do on custom built hardware on that cloud provider instead. So it's essentially having access to hardware, except you don't have physical access to it. It is on the cloud, you're outsourcing that hardware to someone else, outsourcing that cost of building it and getting everything set up. With uh, the software component, you can either, instead of developing a software component of an information system yourself, you can license software from another company, such as licensing a email server software from Microsoft or outsourcing a payroll software from some company in order to pay your employees. Or you can even outsource development, kind of like what I was talking about before, where you outsource uh, to a company or a programmer in order to make you something custom. Uh, you can also, for hardware and software, outsource all of that to platform as a service. So not only do you get the outsourced hardware infrastructure where you're using someone else's uh, hardware, but you can also get the platform such as a, a uh, 
virtual operating system running on that hardware, all of that is set up for you. You don't need to do that yourself. With the hardware, software, and data side of things, you can outsource all of that by using software as a service, uh, help you maybe help you collect data or uh, have some sort of data built in, whatever software as a service might happen there. Um, and then uh, when you're trying to outsource the hardware, software, data, and procedures, you might have a system, sort of like what we talked about with the enterprise application suites, like CRM, ERP, and EAI. Uh, those three systems bundle in the heart, uh, bundle in the hardware in terms of like virtual servers, possibly. Uh, especially if you're if you're using servers that are hosted by the company that makes those softwares, uh, that can count as outsourcing the hardware. There, uh, you have the software, which is what people are using in order to interact with all the databases that hold all of your data, uh, which also you know outsourcing data because you're outsourcing the storage and administration of data by putting a database on cloud storage like that. And then even procedures because these uh, application suites come with procedures so that employees of the companies that are adopting these application suites know how to appropriately use them. And also the operations staff know how to appropriately do things like set permissions and uh, give or remove access to certain parts of the database for certain people based on their job positions or movement through the company or firing or all that kind of stuff. And then if you're trying to outsource the entirety of an information system, everything from the hardware to the people, that might just be contracting a business in order to do the entirety of that work and you know, maybe take in data, do some amount of work with that data in order to create information and then give you the result of all of that, which, uh, oh, I forget which chapter it was that we talked about this kind of stuff. I'm actually running through. Ah, chapter three, when we were talking about business intelligence systems, when we were talking about data marts, uh, data warehouses, all that kind of stuff, data warehouse might count as a, an entirety of an information system being outsourced to another business. Now, of course, there are some risks that come with outsourcing because fundamentally you are entrusting someone external to your business in order to do the job that you're asking them to do. And well, that actually gets into the first piece right here, which is a loss of control. If you are developing an information system, whether it's certain programs for it or whether it's the entirety of the information system, you no longer have control of what is being outsourced. Um, for example, if that company is building custom software for you, uh, they're writing custom code and all that kind of stuff, and then they deliver you the software, there's nothing saying that they can't take that code and uh, you know, maybe package it into their own thing and start selling it to other people. You might have a contract that forbids this, but they might have ways to attempt to get around that contract. And then, you know, that might result in a whole legal battle, all that kind of stuff. But in the meantime, when all these issues are being worked out with potential legal battle stuff coming up, uh, other companies, maybe even competitors, might be benefiting from this work in the meantime. So you might lose a lot of possible income or something like that. So that is, you know, that's one example. Um, you can't necessarily directly check for quality by yourself uh, when you're outsourcing like that. You can't necessarily ensure that the final product is to the quality that it needs to be or even maybe delivered on time or within budget or all that kind of stuff you lose a lot of control in that sense um also the outsourcing uh entity 
the entity that you are outsourcing to, whether it's a company or an individual or a set of individuals or something like that, they, you know, might be acquired by another company or find work at another company and drop the project or something like that. Priorities might change and things, it might be hard to actually get that final product out of them. Uh, so that loss of control can be really rough for a lot of companies. There's a lot more um, loss of control related risks, like the vendor being in the driver's seat uh, for, in terms of choosing technology and making decisions um, that can indirectly affect you. Uh, you know, a bad choice in technology or not taking advantage of a new, better technology might mean losses for your company. Um, it could be the sense that uh, the vendors, you know, the, the company that you hire, they might gain a lot of new skills by working for you and then are able to uh, take that skill, those skills to a competitor and that competitor can benefit from that in a way that you didn't necessarily because they're building the skills while you were paying them, but then the competitor gets to pay them while they already have the skills. So that can be a little bit of an issue. Um, let's see if uh, priorities get kind of out of whack. Uh, there's a difference in the priorities of the or that the uh, vendor is using to actually create the um, to actually create the product and priorities that you need for your own company that can be a little rough. Also, it's very possible that the CIO, the chief information officer uh, themselves, becomes a little bit superfluous if too much of the information system is being outsourced. And at that point, the company might as well just get rid of the entire information systems department and just hire on this company or contract on this company in order, in order to keep uh, doing that kind of work if they're doing pretty much the entirety of the information system. So uh, with that in mind, a CIO might try to make some inoptimal uh, bad decisions in order to keep their job, uh, maybe try to quote unquote implement you know, something that uh, would be harmful to the company or isn't necessary for the company, but makes it look like uh, they are still doing something. and. It gets really rough, so you, you can end up with that kind of rough situation as well. Um, there are some possible long-term costs that could outweigh the initial benefits of outsourcing. Uh, one of them being that a outsourced vendor might change their pricing strategy, especially if they know the company is reliant on them or if there's no other options or stuff like that. So they might be able to start charging the company more and more and more in order to get the more out of that company. So the initial savings that that company had might end up being wiped out by the fact that the vendor is charging them more and more and more. Uh, another possible issue is that if the vendor company, the company that is being contracted, has some issues with mismanagement, uh, this mismanagement could end up being really costly for the company that's contracting the vendor. Uh, the mismanagement, the inefficiencies, that kind of stuff that might make things take longer or require more fixes or all that kind of stuff. And then the bill is eventually on the company that is contracting the outsourced vendor. So mismanagement uh, type of risks could also be really bad. Also, there's the possibility that you lose things like the economy of scale. Um, for one, if a, uh, if a, an organization is outsourcing all of their server work to a company that has a fixed number of servers and then their need increases 200 times, if that vendor can't, um, actually do like increase their server load by 200 times, they might need to outsource to additional companies, which might end up costing them 200 times what they were paying. Instead, if they were doing things in-house, um, 
it would be a huge expense if they had to increase their own server capacity by 200 times if they had to build all that stuff themselves possibly move things to new warehouses or rent out new warehouses or get all that stuff set up but because of economies of scale because they're able to get bulk pricing it might end up being cheaper in the long run there's also no easy exit from an outsourcing type of relationship uh, with an employee you could uh, fire them so long as say appropriate notice is given or you know all the labor laws are followed uh, you would be able to fire an employee relatively easy however with a uh, vendor that you're outsourcing to there are contracts in place that might prevent you from immediately severing that connection they also have uh, a huge amount of knowledge of how your business works. They potentially have control of services that were vital to your company that you would then have to find a replacement for extremely quickly uh, in order to successfully cut contact. Um, they, even if they're not malicious, which there is the possibility of a vendor being malicious and doing something bad once you caught contact with them, like selling information over to a competitor, even if they're not malicious though, like losing access to uh, their work that you were possibly relying on can be really costly. So then you have to uh, shut down whatever services you were using uh, that relied on their technology until you could very quickly find a replacement. And hopefully you wouldn't have to build something or find someone new to build a replacement or something like that because that could take a very very long time um especially if it's related to something like a network or something to do with all of the organizational data or something if something went wrong uh with that transition or even it doesn't even have to go wrong, even, even if it goes really well, shutting down vital services like that for um, a day or a few days or even weeks or God forbid months at a time could be extremely detrimental. So thinking about that before you even start outsourcing to a company, thinking about, well, what if something goes wrong here? Um, and thinking about an exit and how much that might affect your uh, company before even starting to outsource. That could be really important. Well, that is the discussion of outsourcing here. The next video will be talking about user rights and responsibilities with regards to actually uh, using an information system.